Hello there. Welcome to the Firewatch audio tour. My name is Rich Summer. I voiced the character of Henry, the guy that you're currently controlling with those buttons there. And I'll be chatting with you in a little bit. Thanks for checking it out. Hi, I'm Sean Vanneman. I wrote the bulk of 100% of this game. (laughs) Hey, I'm Jake Rodkin. I did a lot of level design, UI design, and... uh worked with everyone on the story for Firewatch. The game has this weird structure that Chris and I talk about in another tape. This is the first thing I wrote was this opening of the game that jumps between Henry's life and the trip out to the woods. And I used a little product called Twine to do that, which you can download and use. It's just a very simple choose-your-own-adventure tool. The simplest way to program a video game that one can then share with friends and play. Um, I think we were worried that the team would sort of perceive Henry as a blank slate, as sort of a generic game player protagonist, and we wanted to make sure... Or we wanted to get in everyone's mindset, you're playing as a specific guy with a specific life. Yeah, there's a reason when you play video games that a lot of your uh, protagonists have amnesia. Because uh, it's really difficult when you're driving a character around uh, who knows things about their life or his or her life that you, who you ostensibly are that person, don't know. So, yeah, um, we kept trying to write an opening of the game that happened sort of like weeks into Henry's experience and then quickly realized that it was like, well, why would he not be able to say X. Well, because his relationship with his wife is Y. So, but the player doesn't know that. Yeah. And this was the quickest way to get everybody on board, was to just take the thing that I wrote that answered the question, I think, for Jane and you at the beginning, which was like, who is Henry? And I would write these character profiles that were really bad. And then I went, ah, what if I just let you play a thing? And then you can figure out who he is. And we held on to that until we had the idea to put it into the game. It means that when you're playing Firewatch and Henry and Delilah start talking about Henry's wife, You don't have to learn it through his dialogue, because you made the choices that brought him where he is today. Hi, it's Jake again. Hey, I'm Chris Remo. Oh, hey, Chris. Hi there. I was a game designer and the music composer on Firewatch. Nice. So you're hearing now the first piece of interactive music that went into Firewatch, the first piece of music that actually... Responds to what you're doing in the game? Exactly, yeah. So this is a piece of music that's divided into um, technically six parts, and... What's happening is as you're playing through this introductory sequence, um, when you hit certain points in the narrative, it sends a signal to Wise, which is the name of the audio middleware we're using. And then when Wise gets that signal, it waits until the next sort of musically appropriate transition point. And then when it hits that, it smoothly transitions into the next section of music. And so it creates the effect that you're just listening to one big, long piece of music that just happens to be timed very nicely it just happens, to your playthrough. It just happens to get sadder and sadder at the exact rate <laughs> that your life gets sadder and sadder. Yeah, exactly. Th- this was a challenging process, both because I had no idea what the music should, should sound like, and also because it was the first interactive piece of music in the game. So the, the technical... Sort of just how does this work was was also a part of it. I but as it turned out, this music was changed. I mean, Jake, you may remember this. This music changed relatively little over the course of development yeah, in I comparison think, to a lot of. The I think other we music. it started off as maybe three pieces and it expanded out to five over mm-hmm. development. But other than that, it's yeah one of the first things dropped in yep. shipped. Get ready to hear about that a lot on this commentary. <laughs> I'm Nels Anderson, and I was a designer and gameplay programmer on Firewatch. I am Jane Ng, and I worked on the 3D environment art in Firewatch. So you're likely standing at the base of your your home away from home, your home in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> For all intents and purposes, more or less, this is basically just a real straight up tower mm-hmm. like they existed out in the woods, right? Yeah, I think some I think it is Portland. There's somebody in Portland who uh, was very good about archiving a lot of uh, you know, blueprints about various type of fire lookouts of, you know, of of the state and we got some and uh so we that's how we started off building the firewatch, I mean the lookout tower it's just by looking through how they were actually built. It's slightly taller than a real one, right? We had to make quite a bit of adjustment because, for example, the stairway you see here, normally fire lookout stairways are not on the outside, but, you know, for 
more interesting gameplay and uh, views for the player. We opted to change that. But, you know, ultimately, we still wanted the tower to feel like a real tower. So mm -hmm. we had to figure stuff like, hey, how does the plumbing actually work? And how do right. they get water? You know, stuff like that it actually is very important for a real tower. And if you go, like, look around the base of the tower, you'll actually see a big old plastic <laughs> cistern. <laughs> you know, we are not a survival game of any sort, but it is important to make sure that, like, all that stuff is actually thought out so the space feels realistic. Right. You don't, you don't want someone playing the game being like, wait a minute. There's no how do how does this guy drink? How is he not dead? When I normally play video games, I'm always interested in stuff like, hey, where's the bathroom? You know, so you know, here we have the outhouse and you can go anywhere, but stuff like water is very important. So in a real in a real fire lookout situation, what they do is they will use um like a cistern and they will capture rainwater from the roof and you will actually see that we actually have a little pipe down from the roof and we even have what they call a first flush filter being there which is actually what they use that i mean that's my favorite kind of filter really <laughs> you had to look at well, what like what do they do because like once you go okay you collect roof like uh, rainwater from the roof but want to be all nasty and then oh hey somebody already figured that out on how to collect rainwater what do you know we actually visited um, a number of different lookout towers as we were like researching the game, and it was always very satisfying to see elements of things we saw in the real world and uh, make their way back into the game, and vice versa. So we also made sure to have a tab here, like a little faucet, where you can actually get water from the cistern. <laughs> yeah, if you click on it, it will play an animation of a hand gripping a <laughs> knob, and water comes out for two seconds. It doesn't do anything! Yeah. But it's there. I think for a while we actually were thinking, like, should we just let the player turn on the water? But then what happens if the water just runs out? And then James, right. <laughs> and then James had a very good idea of just going, like, oh, just make one animation that you turn on the faucet and turn it off immediately, just so that you know, hey, there's water in here and you won't die. That's Henry. Hey, it's Chris again. Oh, it's Jake. So if you're listening to this right now, it's because you went off the beaten path uh, really early in the game. Obviously, you probably did that because the commentary map told you to. Uh, but but we, you don't need a map to tell you to go here. You no, could, you could yeah. just go here. We had to. Th one of the biggest challenges in this game was throughout the entire narrative, uh, keeping in mind that really players can pretty much go anywhere uh, that they've unlocked on the map uh, at any time, and sometimes that's actually really inconvenient for the narrative of the game. Uh, we had to come up with a lot of excuses for why you couldn't go to certain places at certain times, or if we couldn't think of an excuse. Some, some call it an excuse, others call it a thrilling narrative event. <laughs> right, so for instance, uh, where you are right now, if you keep walking in that direction, you will sort of cross the river, but then be unable to go any further. Um, because... There's like a lot of dense underbrush. And then about halfway through the game, um, when a, you know when a big fire happens, that area is burned out, and you can walk past it into uh, Cottonwood Creek and and Pork the, Pond, etc., and all those areas. Yeah, it was really really hard to think of justifications like that that weren't completely implausible. Yep. And so we actually have relatively few cases of that in the game. Yeah, if we couldn't come up with a good way to keep a player out of a space, we instead flipped the other direction and went, well, what can we do to support it and make it interesting? On on this day, before the story started, not a whole lot, but uh, it's it, we thought it was fun to point out that you can wander a lot more of the map than you might even think at the very, very, very start of the game. Yep, and then, espe and then especially once you get ropes... That increases a lot more, um, you know, so just as you get these items that allow you to explore more of the world, we had to face these increasingly complicated and uh, frustrating design challenges of how does the whole game not break all the time now? It was, it was interesting and difficult, but also cool. Yep. Bye. <laughs>